Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I am your humble host, Coach Jason Coop, and I'm excited that everybody is here with me today because we have a killer guest lined up on tap for you all. It is a guest whose work I have been familiar with and I have utilized as a coach for many, many, many years, probably 15 years now that I'm actually thinking about it. It is none other than Dr. Philip Skiba. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with Phil, he is one of the most renowned endurance coaches in the world today, playing counsel to some of the top athletes, including Paul Radcliffe and Elliot Kipchoge. He is an absolute mastermind when it comes to physiological testing and using field testing to determine training ranges for athletes. And most notably and most impactful in my coaching career, he's also an author. His previous two books I have bought countless times for our coaching staff as they are getting up to speed. And his new book that just came out that I cannot wait to dig into, Scientific Training for Endurance Athletes, is an absolute must have on any serious athletes and any serious coaches uh, library. I wanted to bring Phil on the podcast today, today to discuss one of these aspects that I'm really fascinated about, and that is the use of physiological testing to inform coaching practice. This is something that I have a, an extensive background in with our laboratory, our physiological laboratory here at CTS. And Phil also happens to be, like I said earlier, an absolute mastermind in this where he has all types of tools available to him to help inform what is going on with athletes. And how he uses those might actually surprise you. We get into that right on the onset of this podcast. And one of the things that I have come to appreciate about Coach Phil the most is his very practical pragmatic approach to how he can use data and physiological testing in order to inform practice and help guide athletes. So with that as a backdrop, I'm getting right out of the way. Here is my conversation with Dr. Philip Skiba, all about testing and how we can better help athletes. The book finally came in. Congratulations yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised at how well it's doing. Uh, good. I think all of us who publish a training book because this stuff is inevitably boring, we have such low expectations of how it's going to sell. And then for whatever reason, we end up, uh, uh, we end up, uh, end up outdoing ourselves, so to speak. I mean, my, my, fir my first couple of books like sold really well. Yeah. And then when I went to work on breaking two, I just didn't have time for everything. So I ended up taking it off the market because I wanted to update it anyway. And so so yeah, I didn't have any books on the market for, for more than five years for, for, for 26, seven years. Yeah. Wow. So, like my old book went up to, it was up to like $800 on, uh, on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's old copy, right? Supply and demand, right? Exactly. right? There's no supply and no demand. <laughs> it must mean that the price goes up. <laughs> so yeah, when I rolled out the new one, it was just like, it was like kaboom. I, I couldn't keep it in stock for about three months. And so finally now I'm in now able to kind of match. I'm now 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 able to match. It's okay. So yeah, well, congratulations. It's a it's a it's a it's a really clean work. I, the previous two books, I I've probably bought a few dozen copies each for for our coaching staff when they come in at, at various times, just because it's a good wow. resource to get them them grounded, you know, and make sure that we're all speaking the same language and. I can't profess to have read the entirety of the second book already, but I just looking through it, it looks like it's pieced together in, in, a, in a, in a similar fashion. And one of the things I'll also give you credit for is what you skip over, which I think like speaks to the level of the audience <laughs> that you were intending, right? Like you, you deliberately skip over some stuff. It's like, listen, you guys got to look this yeah. shit up yourselves. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, um, but but yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, it's probably, I don't know, probably half new material, half old material. Yeah, that's what it seems like. So, yeah. um, so, so I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a pretty good balance between the between the old stuff and the new stuff, and and so I mean, so far people are doing it pretty well. So so I'm happy. Good, good for you. Well, I wish you the best with it. We'll talk about various pieces of the book here and there as it as it kind of gets weaved into the story. But I really want to take the opportunity and, and speak to you a lot about uh, performance testing. 
and how we translate that in the real world. I think your experience that you have as a coach and in particular with the types of athletes that you work with and also wow. your experience with breaking two and the long-term listeners of this podcast will remember uh, I had uh, uh, Brad on the podcast who was the head of that project uh, maybe six months ago or something like that. Wait, well, yeah, um, they, I didn't realize yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's great. He's actually been interfacing with a few of my athletes on other projects as well. So it's a very small circle that we that we weave. Um, but I, I think that you're in, in a really unique position to kind of help solve one of the problems that I have always struggled with in trail ultramarathon training, and that's just how to make sense of the data that's coming across the wire that we see that we see in the field in terms of how do we evaluate workouts and how do we figure out what the demands of the individual events are. And I know a lot of uh, physiological testing that we can do in a laboratory setting that can help collaborate those numbers and the, the that phenomenon that we actually see in the field can help uh, tell a little bit of that story. But, but but before we get into it too yeah. much, take just take a second and describe like what like what you do professionally for the listeners so they can get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, so you know I wear a couple of different hats in my life. Um, I run sports medicine for Advocate Aurora, which is one of the largest uh, healthcare systems in the United States. Um, and so as part of that, I'm seeing patients every day. I also run. Uh, we have three different physiology laboratories, two full exercise physiology laboratories with metabolic carts and treadmills and ergometers and all that stuff. And then two biomechanics laboratories, um, one of which is combined with a phys lab um, where we have a 10 camera Vicon motion capture system and force plates in the floor and, um, and the whole nine yards. Um, and so that's kind of the fun part of my medical job because I get to test athletes, I get to test you know just, just regular people off the street. Um, I get to combine that with physical therapy and pulmonary rehab, even for our, our post-COVID people. Um, so all that's really exciting. Um, the other part of my job is, you know, my, which is a bit separate, is all the consulting work I do in elite sport. Um, and I work from, with everyone from Paralympians to Elliot Kipchoge to um, a lot of professional triathletes and things um, in a variety and really a variety of different sports around the world. Um, so, yeah, I do a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I really talk to people like you, I'm like, how do you like fit it all in? Because just to take one of those and it's a full time job. Yeah, I mean, it requires a lot of time management. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, one thing, one thing, one thing often plays off of the other, you know, like, for example, for breaking two, you know, my health system got so much good publicity from that. They were willing to let me out of a lot of doctoring type stuff to allow <laughs> me to go to, to go full on with that because, you know, they liked having a National Geographic movie with one of their doctors uh, co-starring. So, uh, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm a yeah. lucky guy. I, I, I really enjoy what I do every day. Well, and so, and it's because of that background that I think that this is the perfect setup to talk about how we can take testing. And I was going to mainly limit it to physiological testing more in the interest of time. But if we go down some sort of combined biomechanics and, and metabolic testing rabbit hole, by, by all means, the floor is yours. But yeah. I really want to, I really want to explore that area and, um, talk about how trail and ultra runners can can take information like that and make sense out of it and apply it in a real world uh, applicable setting. This is one of those sports. It, it's really interesting. I was actually just uh, talking, uh, speaking just before I got on the phone with you with one of my colleagues from uh, Training Peaks, who I'm sure you're familiar with is Dirk Friel. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we, we, were, we were reminiscing about the power meter revolution in the early, uh, kind of in the early 2000s, yeah. where, cycling, where cycling power meters became, you know, we were always used in the pro peloton before then, but they certainly never raced with them because they were just too, too darn heavy. But the combination of the pro peloton being so seclusive about what they were doing for, for obvious reasons now and now in retrospect, uh, a combination of that and the fact that these power meters became more accessible and more affordable, we ended up having this really powerful tool that we could use in the field to prescribe training, analyze the demands of an event, analyze the demands of any sort of other, of other training ride. And it really informed our coaching practices like no other, like no other revolution. And I think in the trail and ultra space, there's no real equivalent of that because the surface and the duration kind of confounds all of those different variables. But I think that there's lessons to be learned. 
So let's kind of, it's not a reverse engineering of a problem. It's kind of engineering it from the get go. Why don't you describe some of the tests that you would take an athlete through that came to you and said, Hey, listen, I'm an endurance athlete. I'm a, you know, Ironman triathlete. I'm a trail or ultra runner. What tests would you recommend that they would do? And what's the value proposition essentially that the, that the athlete would get from those? I, I, I got, I got to be honest with you. And, and I say, this is a guy who, you know, does a lot of testing every day. Um, 95% of athletes don't need any testing at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and people don't often don't like to hear that because they watch something, they watch what we did with the guys in breaking two. I mean, that for me, that's like the best advertisement there is. They're like, Skiba, hook me up to the middle of the park, the yeah. cart, like do all this stuff. It's like, Hey, oh, oh, hang on a second. Hang yeah. on a second. Um, because if you're tracking your data on a day-to-day -day basis and you're training hard and you're racing once in a while. Um, and you always got that GPS on, you're always running your power meter, I can tell a tremendous amount from that. Um, and because because uh, the first the first question you always ask is, is your goal even reasonable? Um, mm -hmm. And 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 I can tell you, like over the years, you know, especially once gyms started getting in these kind of fake metabolic carts that you can buy for a couple thousand dollars, right? Uh, yeah. um, and then someone comes into me and says, you know, oh, my VO2 max is 70. Why can't I keep up with, you know, you know, name, name the pro cyclist of your choice. And mm -hmm. it's like, because your, your VO2 max is not really 70 because you were sold a false bill of goods. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so I, that's always the first thing I ask, like, are we even in the ballpark, you know? And if not, is there reason to get into the, is there reason to believe we can? Um, the easiest thing in the world is field testing where we do some uh, critical speed or critical power testing. And, and by that, I mean that we send you out um, because um, rightly or, or well, no, I'm not gonna say rightly or wrongly, wrongly, um, people think critical power is something it is not. For many years, due to a particular training book, people thought critical power meant the power you could hold or the speed you could hold for a particular duration. So there was a critical power two for your best two minute power and five for your five and so on. And that's not the way it is in real life. In real life, there's one critical power, there's one critical speed. And that is the point at which your physiology goes from stable to unstable. And the way you figure that out is by doing a few tests, at least three. So I send you out on your bike and I make you crush it for two minutes. I make you crush it for six, seven minutes. I make you crush it for 15 minutes. And I do some stuff in Excel and I draw a curve and I tell you where that threshold, and I tell you where that critical power is, that critical speed is, that threshold that you feel. It's about your 10K pace if you're a runner. Um, and that's the most important thing I can tell you to start with, because what that does is tell me where you go from a state where you're primarily limited by how much glycogen you got on board, how well you're being fed, all that kind of stuff, uh, what your fatigue resistance is, et cetera, to a state where your physiology is fundamentally no longer steady and everything you can think of is treading in a bad direction that's going to result in you getting tired and having to stop probably within 20 minutes. The, and the way that we've described it in our lab and, and I've described it to my athletes is, is it becomes the anchor of which all of your intensity ranges orbit. Around. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. Um, I, I think to, so the listeners are, there's going to be a lot of listeners that are, that, that think they know what critical power or critical speed is. And they're probably in their minds conflating it with lactate threshold power or lactate threshold speed. Right. What's the differences? What are the differences between those two? Well, it, it depends how good an athlete you are. Okay. For the average person, lactate threshold. So to define it, it's where lactate first begins to rise in your blood. We define it as a rise of one, one millimole. Okay. So on your little lactate meter, it goes up by one. First time you see that, if you started out at 1.5 and now you're at 2.5, you've crossed your lactate threshold. And that's important. Below that speed um, or below that power where that that change happened, um, you're primarily using your slow twitch muscle fibers. Your muscle fibers that are very endurance oriented, they're not very strong, but they're they're resilient. They can go, you can go for a long time on those. Um, your oxygen use is uh, is very stable, okay? It comes up and it levels off and you just carry on, okay? But once you cross that lactate threshold, what's happening now is a bunch of different changes are going on in your body. You're burning more sugar, you're burning more glycogen from your muscles, um, and you have a limited amount. When you see people who bonk at mile 20 in a marathon, this is usually what happened. They burn through all their glycogen that they have on board. You're recruiting your type 2A muscle fibers. These are the faster twitch fibers that you can 
train enough to make them more enduring or endurance oriented or train them harder to make them more sprint oriented. Um, for our purposes here at Ultra, we want to keep them more endurance oriented. And then as you go up through that zone, what happens is your oxygen use begins to rise disproportionately. So it's no longer this nice, it rises and flattens out. What happens is that it rises and flattens out and then it starts to rise again. And that's called the slow component. And so what's happening is that you are becoming less economical with every step you take. It's costing you more oxygen than expected to do the work that you're doing. It'll level out again. It may take 30 minutes, but it'll level back out. Okay, so things will remain stable. It will stabilize eventually. And you're okay there until you cross that critical power or that critical speed, which is where everything kind of goes off the rails. Yep. So the idea is that you have these functional discontinuities in your physiology where things take a turn, where things change appreciably. And it's important for us, us to understand those things if we want to exercise for 10 hours. Um, otherwise, we're going, to have a, we're going to have a bad day. For sure, for sure. <laughs> so, you, so you mentioned this testing protocol, right? You're having somebody go all out for two minutes, all out for seven minutes, and all out for 15 minutes for those are three time mm -hmm. frames. And you're having yeah. them repeat that test, those all out tests, three different times. And I think this is important for the kind of the listeners to understand. There's a specific reason why you have them repeat it three times. Why is that? Instead of just so, doing it once and taking the numbers from there, which is well, what we always well, like to no. do. Well, no. I mean, I, I typically do one. So in a week, I'll test them three times. Yeah. You know, one day we'll do the three minute, one day we'll do the seven minute, one day we'll do the 15 minute. Okay. And then I've got a pretty good, if I, if I look at the model and it looks clean and it's a high R squared and it's very linear, um, then I'll say, yeah, okay, this is a good model. But, um, you know, you can do more testing. You can do five tests to, to try and get, get a better, uh, to try and develop a better model, but it's hard to do. Um, but I'll repeat this testing throughout the season because these numbers move, right? right? As you get fitter, they're going to shift. And that model gives us two numbers. It gives us the critical power, which is nice, but it gives us something called the W prime on the bike or the D prime when you're running, which is like a battery. It tells me how much energy you have to spend when you cross that critical power or critical speed. You can blow it quick by sprinting, or you can ride just above your critical power and burn it out over 20 or 30 minutes. But in either case, that battery is the same size. And it's crucial. Because once you burn through the battery, you, you typically end up walking, or at least you can't go any faster than critical power. So if an athlete were interested in like carrying out and performing this test themselves, hmm. outside of, you know, by, buying your book, and following the kind of the instructions that are in there and learning how mm -hmm. to fit the curve there. Like where would they go as a resource to, to learn more about that? I mean, if you Google critical power testing, um, you know, you're, you're probably going to find it. You can find it in any exercise, you know, physiology journal at this point, or everyone's publishing about it. Um, but it's not, it's, it's genuinely not hard to do. Um, so what you do is you do those three tests. So let's say I do my two minute test. So that's uh, 120 seconds. And let's say I average 300 watts. I multiply my 300 watts by 120 seconds, and that tells me how many joules of energy I spent. And I do that for the other tests. And I plot it in Excel. On the y-axis, I have uh, the joules, okay? On the bottom axis, right, the, 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 the x-axis, I've got seconds. And I plot it. And I tell Excel, make me a linear regression. There's a little button there, right? And it does it, and it's going to show you the equation, okay? The number that's next to the X, that's your critical power. The number that's after the plus sign, that's your D prime or your W prime. It's very, very high school math oriented, right? I think you give really? this to any, any, any high school math student, they'll be able to figure that out. Well, and here's the thing, you know, people have often said to me over the course of my career, Skiba, like you were never any great athlete. How is it that you have trained all these world champions, these world record holders, these Olympians? Um, Honestly, a lot of it has to do with having good Excel chops. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot that you can do with just the field data or the data that you get out in the field if you're willing to, you know, harness it as opposed yeah. to using the standard uh, programs that are out there and kind of make whatever you want to yourself. Well, and just get rid of all the kind of the, the hocus pocus and the nonsense, right? You're doing a training program. 
if it's working, you should be getting faster. If you are not getting faster, there's a problem. Um, and so if you bring it down to that most basic level, you can just you can just be honest with yourself and then figure out what you really need to do. So so you're using so once again, you're using this test as to determine what the intensity anchor is. Yeah. What's the next step after that? Are you building the training ranges around that in terms of the, the intensity zones? Yeah. So basically, you know that for most people who are pretty fit, um, that the lactate threshold is going to occur at about 70 percent of that of that critical power, that critical speed. You know, um, you know, the, if you're talking about since we're talking about runners here, um, you know, ultra running and stuff, lactate threshold um, is going to be roughly your marathon pace for a well-trained athlete. So that'll, that'll ballpark it for you. Um, if it's too much different than that, then you, you might not be doing something right. Yeah. Um, and, and so really what you're doing is um, you're setting up your zones on that basis. So below that lactate threshold, below that 70%, that's where all your, your long endurance training happens. Um, not that you always stay there, but that's where the lion's share of it is, is below, is, is down there. Um, in that middle space between the lactate threshold and the critical speed or the critical power, that's where kind of your tempo training does, uh, you know, it, it, it is. And so, um, you know, I often will prescribe blocks of training there, you know, so you're doing a two hour, you know, two hour run. Well, in the back half of that run, I might, might have you do a bunch of 800 repeats up in that middle space. Um, Critical speed or critical power, plus or minus about 5%. That's kind of your threshold zone. A lot of different kinds of training you could do there. And then above that, um, you know, you're sort of doing your harder interval stuff, right? That's where you're doing your, your 400 repeats. Your, it all depends on how fast you are, right? Um, but that's where you're doing your real interval work. And with the with the athletes that you have the like the opportunity to work with over multiple seasons, you mentioned that you know, you're kind of coming back to this test. How much are you actually changing those training ranges, either based off of what you're seeing in the field? Because in theory, if you have really good training data, and the athletes are, are, are doing interval work kind of across the entire spectrum over long periods of time, you should be getting data points that almost mirror what you would do in this particular uh, in this particular well, yeah, test. Well, yeah, well, it really depends on um, on the way you choose to structure your training. So, yeah. from my perspective, I try not to let my athletes empty the tank too often in training. Yeah, um, because that, in my experience, there's a recovery cost there um, that that damages your training for following days, right? Which is what we don't want to do. Um, you know, the story I always tell people about is Joanna Zeiger back in 2008 when she won the world championships, the half Ironman distance and set the world record. In that month before that race, she was saying to me, Phil, I got another gear now. I can feel it. You know, and I'm saying, that's good. Leave it alone until the race. You know, don't go there. You know, there's a, there's a time for that and it's race day. Um, so I really try to keep rest, testing or racing quite separate from, from training. Yeah. Um, now, if somebody totally blows out their their testing numbers in training, which occasionally happens, um, you know, someone has a really good day, and then all of a sudden, you know, their their you know their their long kind of threshold intervals, all of a sudden they're putting up ten or fifteen more watts or something out of nowhere. Okay, well that's a sign that we should probably test again, or at least we can start training them yeah. on the basis of that new data. So you're not entirely wrong about that. I just try not to do that on purpose. Yeah, this is the, this has always been my contention with coaches that kind of like overuse power duration curve or pace duration curve to like say whatever. You're you're fitter. You're more fit in this area. You're less fit in this area. Whatever. It's it's always confounded by effort. The athlete can always put yes. out more effort if you instruct them to do so at whatever particular workout, and that's going to confound your power duration curve along that yeah. particular spectrum. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, prophecy in a lot of cases. And it's, the other thing that's important is that a lot of what you see in the power duration curve, and I don't care which product you use, um, is artifact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Because there's parts of it that where you were pacing well, there's parts yeah. of it where you weren't, there's, there's, make, there's mathematical averaging. Um, that goes on. So it's a, it's that curve is a ballpark. It's not a map. Yeah. Um, you know, 
Okay, so you so you already you already you already shifted the tone of my conversation. I wanted to talk about physiological testing because that's what I wanted to talk about. And you started yeah. going to field work, which is totally fine. Yeah, let's talk this, about physiological testing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I mentioned it's totally fine because that's kind of what we have in trail and ultra running. Because, like I said, the the tools that we have are very rudimentary. But let's back it up. Let's try to take like you know the perfect. Somebody's going to come to you and film a documentary, and you want to pull out all like the bells and whistles from a metabolic perspective. When when you're in that situation, what are the tools that you're preferring to? What are the tools that are you that that you're preferring to use? Yeah, so uh, I, you, you test them sport specific. So if it's a cyclist, they're going to ride. If, they, if it's a runner, I'm going to make them run. Um, and, and you want to make sure that uh, the equipment you're using, number one, is well calibrated. So you ought to be asking that question. When was the last time your stuff was serviced? Yeah. You know, are, are we sure this stuff is going to work? Okay. Um, and, and I say that because last, a couple of years ago, I had a, a world champion athlete show up in my, um, or a national champion athlete show up in my clinic and, and the cart went down, the CO2 sensor blew. Um, and it was like, it was really embarrassing. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, you want to make sure that everything is, is, is properly serviced, um, you know, et cetera. Um, so first thing we're gonna do is a ramp test. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, uh, get them on the bike. We're gonna do a 30 watt per minute ramp. So they're gonna ride a baseline of about 20 Watts for three, four minutes, make sure everything looks stable. And then we crank it up by half a Watt every second. Um, and so now you got this power rising and we're gonna watch your VO2. Um, and we're just going to keep doing that, um, you know, and, and, and until you get to the point where I'm still cranking up the power, but your VO2 doesn't rise anymore. We get a plateau in your oxygen use and that's VO2 max, right? So, um, that's really testing the limit of what your heart, heart and lungs are capable of doing. Um, and so from this data, I can now figure out where your lactate threshold is or your gas exchange threshold if I'm not measuring lactate because those two things are the same and we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but um, I typically do it from the gas data. So I've got that now. I know where that first threshold is and I know where your upper limit is, your absolute kind of limit in terms of your endurance performance. Um, once I have that data, then we can set up a series of tests to figure out your critical power, your critical speed, right? So we'll put you on the ergometer um, and uh, and we'll set it for some power, you know, that, that, that's pretty high, but still below your VO2 max. Um, and I'm going to make you ride. And I'm going to make you ride until your cadence drops by five. And once your cadence starts to drop, the test is over. Oh, um, that's true. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering what the cessation of the test would be. Yeah. And since we're usually collecting gas data too at the same time, I can see that you've hit VO2 max and stuff. So I know that you've... You, I know that you've really emptied the, the tank. And we do that a couple of times. And now I know where these different domains are, right? Below lactate threshold, below gas exchange threshold. That's your quote unquote moderate domain or your zone two, for lack of a better word. And between that lactate threshold or gas exchange threshold and that critical power, that's your tempo or your zone three, okay? And then we have that boundary around uh, the critical speed or critical power, which is zone four. And you get five, which is that that area above uh, above that. And so, what's the running equivalent of those of the ramp test and the critical speed test? So uh, we'll, we'll do a ramp test running. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll put you on the woodway. Um, same kind of thing because I, I don't have a mobile uh, meter, so we do it. We do it on the woodway. Um, we get you running, um, and we increase by about uh, 0. 0.5 kilometers per hour per minute. Okay. Um, and so it's a ramp test, same thing. And we keep cranking it up and cranking it up. And then in this one, um, I give, I give the person the option to hit the stop button. <laughs> yeah. Um, because when they, when they feel like they're about to collapse and they can whack the button and, st and stop the treadmill. Um, and so, and that, that test works precisely the same, uh, faster ramp rates tend to work a little bit better than slow ones. It helps you get a better fix on where the threshold is. Yeah. Um, but you, have it, you have it at a constant incline. You're just increasing the speed. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So you, you set it for like a 1% incline. Um, and, and that's based on um, the, my former PhD advisor and my good friend, Andy Jones. Uh, that was one of his uh, studies in his PhD was balancing outside to inside. And so a 1% incline on the treadmill gets you in the ballpark of, yeah, yeah. of wind resistance outdoors. So. Yeah, I, I always love hearing every like all the different protocols that are used out there. We use the Olympic Training Center's protocol, which is a two stage uh, one where we're testing threshold and then VO2 max and two kind of distinct 
mm-hmm. tests that are separated by a 10 minute, uh, 10, 10 minute increment. Mm-hmm. But there's, you know, maybe 20 of these that we can both kind of point to that inevitably, if you're in the space for long enough, you've got athletes that come in that have gone into one of those labs, and then you're trying to compare apples and oranges and bananas and fruit yeah. or whatever it yeah. is. <laughs> I'm going to use that one. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. It's true. Like, cause everybody wants to know. And I would, the, the, honestly, the, 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 the thing that confounds it the most is just the, the, how many seconds you're using for the rolling average, right? Are you yeah. using a 20 second rolling average or a two second rolling average or kind of somewhere in between that, that confounds yeah. the metabolic data, but in the same vein of the field testing, where you're using that to set the intensity anchors, I get it. It's the same philosophy as you're using the metabolic data to to set the intensity anchors of which then you'll kind of carry out in the field. Yeah, and then will yeah. you go out and 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 have the athlete? Uh, do some sort of field testing to corroborate the numbers or the ranges that you get in the uh, in in uh, in the laboratory. I mean, it, it's typically close enough for government work if they've got a good power meter, um, and uh, you know, and if they're working on the track and stuff like that. So it's I, I don't I don't necessarily do it do it like that. Um, you know, people who I test in the lab, I try to keep testing them in the lab. Yeah. So I'm like, if you really want to do it this way. I give them all the caveats of why it may not be necessary for them. Um, sure. But if they really want to do it that way, because look, science is fun. Mm-hmm. I like running these tests. It's, it's always interesting to be able to test people <laughs> and see what they got under the hood, right? Um, but then I want to keep testing them under the same conditions, right? I bring them to the lab. I know it's the same temperature. I know it's the same equipment. I know I've calibrated it and, and so on. Um, so, so that gives us a, a kind of a better, uh, a better yardstick, so to speak. You, you just mentioned this. So you want to find out what's under the hood. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes we can use either field or lab testing and it helps us direct how like the macro periodization looks. And, and I want to know what your experience is like doing that when you test an athlete and you get a peek underneath the hood and you're like, oh, we need to do more of this and less of this or more of that and less of this other thing. Take me through that process in your mind and what things are, that you're looking for to, to help direct that process. So that can be more challenging than it looks. Um, yeah. because typically speaking, things move together. It's pretty hard, for example, to lift critical power without lifting lactate threshold. And it's pretty hard to move VO2 max without moving the other two. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's the challenge. Um, so, so typically what you find is it's pretty late in the training program or pretty late in somebody's career where you really start having to make those split hairs that finely, okay? And, um, you know, because because if you look, you say you look at Elliot, right, his lactate threshold is, is critical. And, and I go through his data in the book. I go through some of Paul Radcliffe's data in the book. Um, when, when you look, you find out that all those zones, all those thresholds are squished together like this, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like, now what do I do? Um, but in, in general, um, what, what I have found um, is that early on, it's pretty easy to lift everything. Um, later on in the program, I tend to, or in the middle part of the program, I tend to be focusing on the sort of critical power or the critical speed. Um, since, since that's the one that's easiest to measure, um, and, uh, and it moves, uh, and so I can document that movement pretty well. Um, and then once I've got you, um, and, and then, you know, once I see that creep and up really close on a VO2 max, then we can start making some other decisions about that. You know, um, do we want to switch over to more, you know, um, interval heavy protocol or something? But, but again, most times, like it's the periodization doesn't necessarily fall out of that testing really in a really rigorous sense, because by the time we're four or five months in, we're getting ready to race. And no matter what I think the physiology is going on, I have to prepare them to race. So we have to be doing race specific training. Um, if that makes sense. Well, and that was what I wanted to get into next. And you described this really well in your pre in your previous books. And I've heard you on podcast describe this also it, it where it kind of almost doesn't matter what type of athlete you're working with in the endurance domain, where it's a 10 K athlete or triathlete or an Ironman athlete or a marathoner. If you apply this general rule of organizing your periodization from less specific to most specific, 
you kind of can't go wrong. Like we tend to, we tend to have, at least in the past, in early in my coaching career, this was definitely the case. We used to have this strategy where we used to have this notion that these systems kind of built off of each other. But yeah. as, as you described, it's you move one and you kind of move everything. I want you to describe that a little bit better and why that's so powerful, though. Well, you know, it's it's like this. Um, your, your physiology is this great, big, interconnected machine. And in the general case, it's trying to make the best of what you've got to do what you're trying to do, right? So let's think about it. Uh, think about it this way for a second. We know that for most people, their most economical cadence on the bike, where they use the least oxygen for the amount of power they're producing, is around 60 RPM ish, right? Right, right. But nobody races at 60 RPM. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because my goal is not to have the most economical performance, yeah. it's not the fastest performance, yeah. right? And so your body ends up optimizing cadence, of, you know, on the basis of the power you need to make. Um, your physiology works kind of in a, in a similar way where it's making the adaptations to try to do what you're trying to do. And now, um, do we need to outsmart it from time to time? Yeah, probably. Okay. Um, one good example of this is when you're doing really long endurance training for long endurance ultra events, for example. Um, it's, uh, you know, when you're down in that lowest zone, that zone two below that lactate threshold, you're primarily stressing this type two, the type one muscle fibers, right? The, the endurance oriented fibers. If you start going a little too hard, you're going to start recruiting more of those type two A fibers, right? I don't have strict evidence for this, but I believe that as you recruit those fibers, um, you might be taking some of the work away from those lower order fibers that you're trying to maximally stress for endurance purposes. Um, so, and so, you know, do I sometimes throw in those blocks of heavier work during a really long endurance workout, a five hour ride or something? Sure I do. I, I typically try to load those towards the back end of the ride when the athlete is capable of it. Because what I'm now doing is, you know, training them to be on tired legs and have to recruit those higher order fibers for when it's necessary. Um, so, so you can do crafty things like that and, 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 but other guys have figured that out on a very non-scientific way, right? You look at the Kenyans, like those guys, you and I can run with them if we're in decent shape when they start out, cause they're running 830 pace or nine minute pace when they start the Kenyan shuffle. But by mile 10, they're running 630 pace and by mile 15, they're running five minute pace and so on. Um, so they're, they're back loading that heavier work too. Yeah, and I've I've heard um, that rationale uh, explained for progression runs and things like that in the past, and I, I get it. I mean, I can kind of understand the physiology behind it. My contention is has always been though it always limits the total amount of work that you could do for whatever you're asking the athlete to do. So if you're asking them to do Correct. like just say ten minutes, right, just to make make it equivalent, we want you to do a ten minute hard block at the end versus the beginning. You're always going to get more kilojoules of work if you do that ten minutes of hard stuff at, at the beginning versus at the end. And so it's right. like a, it's not a Robin Peter to pay Paul, but you have to understand that you're eliciting different physiology, which I guess is to your point, right? You're trying to hack yeah. into the physiology that you want to optimize. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, and that's what's interesting about this, right? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, like, like my buddy Dave Clark says, uh, you know, he coined the term performance engineering, right? And that's what I think of us doing, like, you know, like a, a lot of the, the hand holding and like the talking and stuff That's the coaching, that's kind of the, the art. Um, but there is this part of it, this is very much this engineering approach to, you know, let's try it this way, let's measure the results, like that didn't work, okay, let's try something different. Um, and, and that's just something very gratifying about that, you know, 100%. Um, you know, I, I want to give you a little bit of an opportunity to describe what else is in the book. Um, but when we were off air, um, and for the kind of for the listeners out there, this, this is not Phil's first rodeo at, at, at writing a book and I can appreciate his, his story. I've, I've probably bought, I'm going to ballpark at 40 between the 
the the first two, I can't is it like edition one or edition two or or volume no, one? No, there was the one two. book. There was the physiology book, the blue book, scientific yeah. training for triathletes, and there was the green book, the triathletes guide to training yeah. with power. Okay, so anyway, between between those two, I've probably bought forty of them for our incoming coaches, wow. kind of over the years. Yeah, I mean, thank it's you. A good. Well, it's a, I mean, no, thank you, because I'm, I'm not set up to be a freaking physiology textbook, you know, and a lot of times I need to, you know, we bring in coaches that are at all different stages of their educational levels. And at a certain point, we have to like level that that field so that we can all kind of yeah. communicate with each other. And that's and I guess my point with that is, is this is a resource or those were resources that I would constantly go to to get everybody on the reading from the same book and from the same page. Yeah, absolutely. But with, the, but, but with the new one coming out, when you were writing it, what were there one or two like really remarkable things where you were just like, I wish if everybody understood this it would make athletes and coaches a whole heck of a lot better. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, uh, understanding intensity and and these domains and that they have physiological, um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a discontinuity in physiology where something appreciably changes in the way the body works. Um, that they really understood that that's a, a real phenomenon, that it's, it's not about just going as hard as you want or constructing uh, a workout to be a certain, to look a certain way. It's that the body starts to work in a fundamentally different way at these different points. And you gotta respect that if you wanna have the optimal, you know, you wanna optimally train somebody. Um, and so for me, that was, and that's why I took such care in, in writing that portion of it um, and understanding that connection between the physiology the power duration curve and, and what you observe, what the athlete feels. Um, and, and when you tie those things together, it's really powerful um, in, in terms of the, the level of understanding and the, and the way you can explain things to athletes, help them understand what they're doing to get more buy-in, um, but to just to write physiologically appropriate workouts. Well, and that's what I look, that's the lens that I look at it through. It's getting the right dose because yes. you can always prescribe intensity and maybe get lucky that you're kind of doing it, doing it for a long enough duration or enough kilojoules of work or enough miles, however you want to describe the duration part of it or the, the volume part of it. But if you really understand the physiology behind each one of those intensities, it makes it that much more powerful because everything is, is dose dependent. And if you don't get the, 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 the volume component of that dosing, right. It's just like in medicine where you're not getting the, you know, the amount of milligrams of whatever kind of prescription correct either. Yeah. And if you, if you, because I have the whole, the whole chapter there on impulse response models and yeah. dose response modeling to really drive that idea home, that it works like a dose of medicine. Yeah. And I can give you two aspirin and fix your headache. I can give you three and I can fix your hangover, or I can give you 50 and wreck your kidneys, you know? And, and that there is this like this predictable relationship between dose and response. Or you can give a quarter and not do anything. It's the same <laughs> with training. No, seriously. You're I mean, right. How many, how many athletes, especially really good athletes, underdose their training? It, and when they do it, it's normally for, they don't have enough volume at a particular intensity, right? They yeah. get the intensity correct. They're trying to do a VO2 max interval or whatever but they don't have enough volume at that particular intensity to elicit the response is usually where it goes haywire in, in my observation of, of, of training programs. And, and a lot of that has to do with the kind of people that you're seeing, right? A lot of people yeah. end up to me coming to me because they got hurt or they got sick or something else. And so I often see the other side of the spectrum, yeah. the people that overloaded on something and ended up going over, over going over the edge and doing yeah. something bad. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, but it's about figuring it out. Where's that optimum? How am I going to do that? But it's, is it fair to say, I don't want to like paint you in a corner with this. Is it fair to say that you're typically not ascribing to what most people would refer to a polarized <laughs> way of intensity distribution, where you're using intensity distribution that kind of leverages the whole set of the intensity spectrum from very low intensities to very high intensities, and then you're just modulating the dose in between. 
versus what people would think is what people will typically think is polarized, which might not be entirely true, which is either everything is really easy or really hard and then no, nothing or very little in the middle. Yeah, and you see people who do that, um, but, the, but they're very often not very good. Um, part of the problem with ascribing to this thought process, right, is that you are taking a, a paradigm of training and you're trying to fit an athlete into it. Yeah. And that's the opposite of what you ought to be doing, right? You need to change your training paradigm to fit the athlete. Now, if I am training a, a world-class 3K or a 5K guy, guess what? A, a relatively polarized model can be extremely yeah. appropriate depending on where you're training them, right? But if I'm training an Ironman triathlete, you know, or a marathon runner or something, um, you know, one of the things I do in the book is I break down, you know, uh, Elliot's and, and Paul is training and you would be hard pressed to call those training programs polarized yeah. um, because they're doing a lot of everything and a lot of it's very hard. A lot of it's very intense. Um, so I just, you know, the thing is like, I think part of this is just people need a thing, right? I'm the, <laughs> I'm the polarized guy, right? You know, I'm the threshold guy, right? Everyone needs a shtick. Yeah, it's true. And, and it's like I, I'm like I'm very pragmatic. I'm the what works guy. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> you know? I'm with you on that. I've been in coaching for long long enough where I've seen all these things come around. Right, right. first threshold hit trainings all in vogue, and then it's VO two max training, and then it's polarized training, and then it's like something else. The diets are the same way. Right. Twenty years ago, it was all oh Atkins high protein. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, we're going to call it keto, but it's yeah. going to be the same. I'm not going to say what I want to say, but it's yeah, no, I got you. Same got, thing, different shovel. <laughs> but, but I think, I think from an athlete, once again, I think the athletes that are listening to this, I think the 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 practical take home point is 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 something that I've tried to drive home a lot is is there's room in there for all different types of intensities. We don't have to prescribe to one particular yes. thing. It's just a matter of how much are you leveraging those intensities to what extent throughout the year. Correct. That is really is where the sauce is made. Correct. And how much time do you have to train, right? Yeah. Like doing a tremendous amount of kind of zone three training um, to the exclusion of everything else might not make a lot of sense unless you're a guy who's only got four hours a week to train. Yeah. Um, then it might make more sense, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, that's the thing is how much time do you have to work with? What are your goals and how close to an optimal program can we then develop? Yeah. Okay. Before I let you go, I think it's an important point for athletes to take home uh, some of your viewpoints on supplementation, because I know you see this as a, as, as a medical doctor, in addition to being able to combine it with kind of your coaching knowledge. And I know it seems somewhat out of left field, but um, I think in today's sporting culture in today's age of trying to find really quick fixes for things, we can, we should take every opportunity that we can to really drive home some some key message points here. So I want to hear your view on on supplementation and what the athletes can really take away from that. Yeah, so so that's so that's a great point. And I discuss I have a whole chapter in the book about nutrition and supplements. And you know, I'll refer you to Ron Mon, who is one of the best physiologists ever, right? And and, and a really good guy to have a beer with if you've ever had the opportunity who will tell you that if it works, it's probably illegal <laughs> or at least um, uh, or at least uh, not allowed in sport. Um, and uh, and there's lots and lots of stuff out there that doesn't work at all. Um, so there's, there's a few things that we know work reliably. We know caffeine works. We know nitrate works in the form of beet juice or spinach, you know, smoothie or whatever you want to use. Um, if you're making your own juices to get nitrates, make sure you're buying the cheap vegetables that are grown in the high nitrate fertilizers. Don't buy the stuff from organic farms. It doesn't have enough nitrate in it, typically. Um, and, uh, you know, we know that uh, heat acclimation, going to altitude, we know those, those kind of things work. Um, but in the general case, there are not a lot of things you can put in your body legally um, that are going to improve your performance. Um, believe me, if there were, I would know about it. Um, but the greater risk is this. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of contaminants and supplements. Um, over the course of my career, I cannot tell you how many kids I had show up in my clinic with funny liver function tests. 
and you know, um, and and you know, the doctors didn't really know why. Um, well, funny liver function tests are a symptom of oral steroid use. And this kid's jacked, you know, he's 15 years old and he, and he looks like a linebacker for, you know, or, or a professional wrestler or something. And I'm like, you know, using steroids and they're swearing up and down that they're not. And then we check their supplements and it turns out one of them's, you know, loaded with steroids um, because it came out of some, some lab in Mexico or China or something. Um, so if you're taking these kind of supplements, if you're taking things like creatine, if you're doing, and, and all of a sudden they really seem to work, like work really well, there's probably a bad reason for that, um, and you probably shouldn't be using it. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's no free lunch. So, like I said, you know, optimize your carbohydrates, get 120 grams in per hour of exercise. If you can tolerate that much, if your guts don't get upset, use a little bit of caffeine, use nitrate. Um, but otherwise, you're, you're wasting your time and your money. Phil, to that point, I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to uh, a recent paper that came out. It's titled Dietary Supplements as a Source for Unintentional Doping. This came out like just a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, where they analyzed, I think it was over 3,000 different supplements and found that 28% of them had something unintended uh, in them. It's just a, it's, it's a really big issue in high performance sport. Um, and it's going to continue to be the case just because of how unregulated, it, it, how unregulated it is. So I really appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, I'm going to leave links in the show notes to the book. I hope everybody goes and check it, checks it out. But is there anything else you want to leave the listeners with in terms of how to get a hold of you or how to get a hold of the book? Um, yeah, I mean, you can find the book on, on Amazon unless you're abroad or in Europe or, or around the world. You can find it just on my website there. We'll ship it to you. Um, uh, but uh, you can find me on Twitter. Drop me an email. Uh, you know, I, I try to answer as many of those emails as I can. I, I think part of part of what I'm supposed to be doing in life is, is a little bit of outreach, um, because you know, my my goal. I've often said this in podcasts. My goal as a as a coach has been to put myself out of a job as a doctor. Right. I want you to not get hurt. I want you to not get sick. I want you to not do something silly. Um, and if I can help you do that, I, I certainly will. Um, but, but I appreciate you, you talking to me today, Jason. It was, this was a lot of fun. That's an awesome way to wrap it up, Phil. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I hope you, I hope to bring you back on the next time you publish another book, which is hopefully sooner than, than five years from now or seven years from now. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, buddy. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Dr. Phil. I was weird calling him Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil, Coach Phil, for coming on the podcast today. I hope that was insightful for all the athletes out there. Seriously, y'all, I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to uh, Philip Skiba's new book, Scientific Training for Endurance Athletes. Go and check that out. It is a must-have for all endurance coaches and all endurance athletes. I cannot recommend it highly enough. And if I were to place a bet in Vegas, I would say that over the course of the next part of my coaching career, I'm probably going to buy about 50 of these for my athletes. So maybe I'll just buy them in bulk right now or for my coaches. And maybe I'll just buy them in bulk right now. It really is a fantastic resource. Kudos to Phil for getting it back out there. I appreciate the heck out of each and every one of the listeners. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends and your training partners. I love seeing y'all out in the field and how impactful that the content contained within these podcasts has been to inform you guys of your all of your training and ultra adventures. That is it for today, folks. As always, we will see you out on the trails.